Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see everybody this morning. Good morning, everyone watching uh, at home, wherever you're located. Can we do me a big favor, everybody? Can you just say hello to everyone watching online right now? Re real big and loud. Come on. Say hello. Yeah. I'm so glad that you're here today. My name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time joining with us today, thank you so much for being our guest here today. Please make yourself at home. And uh, if you're watching as, as, as well at home, Please feel free as well to go ahead and comment in the section. You want to say amen or hello or whatever. Uh, we want to encourage you to interact online as well. Well, we're in a series called The Way, The Truth, and The Life. And right now, I would say that we really want to know what the way is, right? What way should we go? What's the truth? And how do I find life? And so we're talking about that today, the claims of Jesus where Jesus talked about that. Let's go through it today, and, and what does that mean? And the context of this passage of Scripture, by the way, happens when Jesus was ready. He was explaining what was going to happen, how he was going to die, how he was going to raise from the dead, and how he's preparing heaven for the people, for his disciples. And his disciples were kind of baffled. I don't know if you've ever noticed that sometimes when God does things, it's kind of hard for us to grasp. Yeah? And so they're you know, scratching their head, and Thomas is like, what's the deal? What's going on? And so I want to go right to the Scripture a launching pad for every single time we meet together during the series. And uh, Thomas says to Jesus, no, we, we don't know, Lord. Where, where are you going? You know? Thomas said, we, we have no idea where you are going. We don't know, God. We don't know what we're supposed to do. I don't know if I'm supposed to retire. Maybe you're going through it right now. I don't know if I'm supposed to go to college or if I'm supposed to go to a trade school or if I'm supposed to stay in my parents' basement. <laughs> I don't know what I should do. Does God call me to be single? Is it God calling me to be married? Am I supposed to uh, go to community college, state college? I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. God, what should I do? And we have all these questions, and Lord, what should I do about my health? What should I do about my parents? What should I do about my children? What should I do about this or the other? We have a lot of questions. Which way should I go, God? Should I stay in Connecticut, or should I move to Alaska? That's a little difficult, that one. Say, if you see San Diego, California, I'd say, oh, never mind. Okay, here we go. But no, Lord, we don't know. Any idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says something so extraordinary and so earth-shadowing that it, it begins to take everyone by storm even today. This is controversial because Jesus makes emphatic statements that are non-negotiable, non that are so clear, and, and it was so scandalous when he said these things. Because Jesus basically tells his disciples and tells us, I am. He says, Jesus told him, I am. And just, to, just that alone, if we stop right there, I am. He's basically saying, I am God. That's what he's saying, I am God. There's no, no dispute about it. Jesus was not some great moral teacher. He literally said, I'm God. And that's why they put him on the cross. So he said, I am the way. Doesn't say, I will show you the way. He says, I am the way. This is it. I'm the way. Then he says, I am the truth. I, I don't give you truth. I don't show you truth. I am the embodiment of truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. There's only one way to God. It's through Jesus Christ. And, and I'm, I'm telling you right now, and I, I, I mention every single week about this, it's important to realize that he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Yes, it's exclusive. Every religion, every person in the world is going to have to go through Jesus. And the only assurance is when we give our life to Christ. And so he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And the moment you make absolutes, 
is the moment you're going to be in absolute trouble with a lot of people because people don't like absolutes. Because if there's absolutes, you can't change them. But what I find so interesting, which we'll get into in a few moments, as we kind of review a couple of the things, Jesus is the way. The very first week we mentioned this. We mentioned direction, the way, not intention, determines destination. You can say all you want that I'm going to go to Disney World, and if you drive straight up to Canada, how many folks know you're not going to be in Disney World? You can be genuine, you can pray, you can even play It's a Small World on repeat play for 12 hours. (laughs) And check yourself into a loony bin, right? Have you ever been on that ride, anybody? It's a small world after all. Yeah, okay. I happen to like it, by the way. Yeah. So direction, not intention, determines destination. Just because you want to go someplace and go the right direction. I just had a situation happen the other night. Jesus says, I am the way. I, I call them the ways, right? The ways. He shows you the ways. I love ways. I don't always listen to ways, and I don't always, I look at the roads, right? But sometimes the best thing to do is to know the way. In fact, I was just picking up Luke the other night from work, my son, oldest son, and uh, hooked him up from work, and we were talking, and I wasn't listening to the ways. So I drove. I've driven, this, I've driven on this for 20 years or more, but I missed the exit. Yeah, because I wasn't listening to the ways. And the ways knows the ways. Jesus is the way. He knows the way, and he is the life. So direction, not intention, determines destination. And we mentioned last week, what is true truth? Truth, right? It's this, facts or information and facts, facts, true information is facts. Facts plus the love of Jesus equals truth. When we look what's going on in our economy right now, we look what's going on in our world right now, we got to gather the facts Okay, plus the love of Jesus in relationship equals truth. Facts don't set you free. Truth does. True truth is Jesus. Facts alone don't save you. It's the truth of Jesus Christ. Facts plus the love of Jesus in relationship equals truth. And then truth is absolute and unchanging. And so this is the, and the people would say, I, I disagree. We talked about this. Remember, we talked about it. We talk about what true truth is. Jesus says, I am the way, I'm the truth and the life. There's no one that comes to the Father except through me. How can you say that? There, there are no absolutes. Everything is relative. Your truth is different than my truth. And so, so people would say there are no absolutes. But do you realize that statement alone is an absolute? If you tell someone there's no absolutes, how can you know that? I asked someone that. How do you know there's no absolutes? Because there's no absolutes. Or do you realize you just said an absolute? By saying there's no absolutes? Yeah, that's what they did. And you know why? Because there are, there are absolutes. And you can't run away from absolutes. You can say what you want. You can make up your own quote-unquote truth. But there are absolutes. There is truth. There is false. And Jesus, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He is the truth. He is the life. Jesus told him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Today we're going to talk about life. What does life mean? What does life mean? No one can come to the Father except through me. So a lot of people run after God's truth. They find God's truth. And if you find God's truth, you're going to be blessed, by the way. Whether you're a believer or not, there are attributes of God that are truth. And think of it this way, everybody. How many of you have ever seen a boat go by? A boat, right? And when a boat happens, what happens behind a boat? They call it a what? A wake. It makes waves. And so a lot of times people in jet skis and stuff like that, and if you're in the Connecticut River, they like to find the big ferries that come by or the big tankers that come by because they make a huge wake. And what they'll do is they'll jump them, which I tried doing one time and I hit my face with the dashboard. But that's beside the point. (laughs) So not in the Connecticut River, but on my honeymoon. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to hear that story, do you? We're not going to go there. So, but anyhow, what happens is there's a wake from the, the vessel, the ship that goes by. And that wake, you can jump for a while, but the wake gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it basically dissipates into smooth water. And so what people do is they follow God's truth behind it because God's truth. All truth God's truth. And so they'll find truth and they'll go after that truth. But the problem with that truth is that truth will disintegrate without being connected to God. You see, God, what he wants us to do is he wants us to connect to him. He's the truth. 
all the wake, all the circumstances that come after him, we can follow and flow in. But if we disconnect ourselves from the truth, we'll be in a degradation of truth. So Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So tell, today, living in life. What is life all about? God wants us to live in life. And so the word life, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, it comes from the Greek word zoe. And zoe simply means substance, property, without which there would not be life. So zoe, it's the substance of life. So Jesus says, I am life. Without Jesus, you pull Jesus out, everything falls apart. In the United States of America, in many ways, we're pulling Jesus out. We're pulling God's truth out. Yesterday, there was a tremendous march and a festival called The Return. There was two things going on simultaneously. Over 100,000 people, uh, it was, it was as far as the eye could see in the National Mall. Did you anyone see the news? No, right? Isn't that amazing? It, you know, if I throw a rock through a window and, and, and say something, they'll put me on the news, but you'll have over 100,000 people talking about God and how we need to get no protest, by the way, peaceful, calling people to God. We don't hear about it. It's sad. You know, you know what? You know, I just want to take a little social commentary, if you don't mind. Unfortunately, this is what happens. If it leads, if it bleeds, it leads. So if there's violence or something destructive, what happens? The media will reward disobedience and violence. If you do something peacefully, they won't give you in the news. So what does that tell people? Gee, if I want to be in the news, I better burn something. I better do something to get attention. But if I'm just peaceful, they're not going to put me on the news. So what does the news media do? They're partially responsible for the violence we see in our culture because they reward violence. Think about it. So, yeah, it's sad. isn't it sad, everybody? It's almost like a child that the parents ignore the child until it does something wrong. And then the parents pay attention. I did that as a kid. I felt that Nord I appeared in my life. Sorry, Mom and Dad, if you're watching. But I started acting like a jerk, so I got attention. So we were celebrating yesterday that when you pull Jesus out of a culture, the culture begins to fall apart because Jesus is life. And without him, everything falls apart. Have you noticed that? Have you, any of you, anyone ever buy a house or a car? Have you noticed how things kind of break down on their own? Don't you wish you had a house that would self-heal? Wouldn't it be nice to, to have a house that all of a sudden you're like, man, it's getting kind of, the pain's getting kind of funny. All of a sudden the, ha the house just decides to pay itself. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice after you use the, the commode, it would clean itself? Wouldn't it be nice if it, okay. But it doesn't happen that way. Everything falls apart because everything is imperfect without God. So we're chasing the wake of life when we can be connected to life. And Jesus is life. In fact, I will say this to you, that anything you, if you chase after anything else but in the life of Jesus, it's all going to fall apart. There's no truth to be found without Jesus. All truth will leave you wanting. Why? Why will all truth leave you wanting if it's not of Jesus Christ? Because it doesn't, if it doesn't have Christ, it's not really truth. You're going after a wake. You're looking, oh, look at the waves here. And you're going there. All of a sudden it dies. I don't find satisfaction in that. Where's the, because the wake maker you have to be connected to. In fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the, the Proverbs, I mean, I'm sorry, the Solomon, the writer says this, all is meaningless under the sun. This world means nothing without God. It doesn't make sense. There's no rhyme and there's no reason if there's no God. And so, if your life is connected to only this life, and you're not connected to the giver of all life, you're going to be wanting it all the time. But if you're connected to God, and you throw your anchor in your place in heaven, and who you are in Christ, it's connecting to the wave maker, the wake maker, and you will be pulled through this life, no matter what takes place. That's what it is. Zoe, life. My grandmother, who I affectionately called Nana, passed away a number of years ago. This is a long time ago, over 25 years ago or so, more than that, actually. And my mother uh, was lying in bed that night, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, she was awakened. Mother. She just felt like, Mother. Her heart fluttered, and she prayed. Well, we've got a call from 
my grandfather that my grandmother passed away. So we drove to New Jersey to, to see her. And uh, incidentally, the, the, the paramedics and things, which she probably, the doctor said she probably died about 2 o'clock in the morning. Isn't it kind of interesting how we're connected? How we're connected to God and how, anyhow, it's a very interesting thing. My mother sensed it. And um, anyhow, so my mother said, I want you to, my mom and dad said, I want you to see Nana. I'm like, really? Yeah, they want to teach me about life and death. I was a young child. So I went into the bedroom, and there she was lying on the bed. And I'll never forget it, the first time I've ever seen a dead body. It was lifeless. It looked like her. She still had, everything was still there, but there was no Zoe. There was no substance, property, without which there would be no life. And so she was just a body, but there was no life in it. And what brings life, everybody, is the very word of God. It's God's presence. It's his Zoe that brings life. If you take away that life, there starts to be death. And so I began to realize, wow. And so it's Christ, Jesus, brings life. And so no matter where you are, we can jumpstart life through Christ Jesus. He says this, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. That's another word, so, so saved. And will go in and out and find pasture. He says, I am. Again, he's saying, I am God. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He's called an angel of light. His job is to kill, steal, and destroy. I came that they would have Zoe and have it abundantly. So abundantly simply means like without measure. Kind of like going to... Maybe you're, if you're, if, how many of you ever went to a grandmom's house, someone's grandmother that was Italian during the holidays? You ever go? Oh, I love it. My, my wife and I went to Italy, and, and this lady was awesome. You know, I was sitting there. I was really hungry, so I, I kept eating the first course, and I kept going, and they brought something else. I'm like, okay. I had no idea what was going on. It kept going on and on and on. They had to take me out in a wheelchair, right? But what's so interesting is this. Have more. Manja, manja. Eat more. more. No, that's enough. That's enough. No, have more. Have more. And I kept having more. I couldn't stop. Well, that's the kind of what we're talking about. God wants to give us an abundance of life, all right? They, they may have life, may have Zoe, and may have it abundantly. God wants to give us life. You see, all of us want an abundant life. You do. I do and you do. How do you know that? Well, that's why we do what we do, right? The advertisers understand that. You want an abundant life. They wear this, drive this, marry this, go with this, do this, do the other, right? Why? Because God gave us a desire to have abundant life. There's nothing wrong with having an abundant life. That's what God made you for. And you're never going to be satisfied until you have an abundant life. So you'll try and try and try and try. The problem is you're going after the wake, not the wake maker. And the wake maker, the life is Jesus. You connect with that. You're connected to the source of it. You experience the, the aftermath of it. You experience the wake of it, but you're being pulled by a person and a relationship. Jesus is the life, and he wants us to have an abundant life. That's what he wants. We choose to do it our way. Our culture says, we don't want to do it your way. We're going to do it our way, and we can see what happens. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide, in other words, live, not just here, Abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you will gnosko, know very intimately. You will know intimately through relationship, intimate relationship. That's what it actually means. So you will know, be familiar, experience the presence of truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In him was, in John chapter 1, verse 4, in him, that's Jesus, was Zoe. And the life was the light of men. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word became God. So what is it? It's the Zoe of Christ. Christ is the life. He holds the universe together. We talked about this time and time again. And the reason I bring this up for, because other world religions talk about connecting, like Hinduism, for example, you have to connect to the energy field. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we have the theologian Yoda and George Lucas who say the same thing, feel the force. There is a force out there. It's the very presence of God. The spirit of Christ holds the universe together. They call it the God particle. 
you know, molecular biologists and you, you name it, astrophysicists, the, the great collider they have over in Europe where they're colliding these subatomic particles. We don't know. There's something that holds it all together. This dark matter, something holds the universe together. It's the spirit of Christ. It's the truth of Christ. You poke Jesus out, it all falls apart. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. So not only is it true in some subatomic particles, it's also true in relationship. It's true in everything, everybody, if we continue to keep him in the middle. Psalm 1611 says this. You make known to me the path of life. Path of Zoe. Actually, the, the Septuagint says that. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Who wants fullness of joy? Right? At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You see, God designed us for pleasure. He made pleasure. He made fun. The devil, what he does is take God's good things, distorts them, and use them as an arsenic to kill you and to kill me. See, in Deuteronomy, they made a choice that Moses began to explain the laws and why God had all these things. By the way, God has these laws and, and, and things not to make our life miserable. He designs us. He makes us. For example, science is a study of how God made things. Think about it. Right? And so the law and many of this was an explanation of how to live according to God's design and how to have a fullness of life. I call heaven and earth the witness against you today that I set before you, not only you, but our nation as well, I, I set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. Choose life that you and your offspring may live. God wants us to choose life. How? Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast, remember, to the wake maker, the one that's pulling you, not going after the things of God without God. That's what can happen in church, by the way. You can start getting really enamored by the wake. Wow, this is cool. I love being in church. I love doing this. I love, having, oh, I love being used by God. And I heard people say to me all the time, I'm up being used. It's not, you, it's not about being used. It's about you serving God. You serve God, you're not going to care if you're being used. We don't want to use anyone. We want you to be utilized by God. So loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of your days, that you may dwell in the land the Lord swore to your father. God gave us promises he wants us to experience. So listen, first thing I want to say is this. Living in life is a choice. You and I have to make that choice because it does not come naturally. It doesn't. We want to live in life, but we have to choose life because what happens is gravity. It takes no effort to do things that are wrong, is there? And so I want to bring your attention to something. I'm not going to go into a long explanation of this, but the two trees. And in the very beginning, our first parents, Adam and Eve, they were in a garden. It was something that God provided, and he provided them all sorts of trees. I'll go ahead and read it to you. And so, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden. Give him anything you want. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then they were tempted by the tempter. You won't die. You'll become like God. In other words, you will become your own God. And by the way, you're not designed to be your own God. You become your own God, you destroy yourself. Because you're not capable of being God. And neither am I. If you think you're God, if you're married to someone that thinks, oh, no, no, that's in the place else. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For the day you eat it, you will surely die. And so what happened was, he saw it was good. It looked attractive, right? And by the way, it was not an apple tree, and this is not an Adam's apple. <clears throat> this morning, I, <clears throat> I made myself some coffee. I grinded it at home and all that. I, I overgrinded it. And this morning, just before I got here, I drank it, and I got the coffee grinds in my vocal cords. So if I'm having a hard time here, <clears throat> it's because I drink manly coffee. It's called truck driver coffee with grinds in it. Okay, the tree of the knowledge. What does I have to do with my sermon? Absolutely nothing. I just have to get a time to get a drink. <clears throat> so, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For the day you eat, you will die. So, life, living in life, how we view God. Let, let, let me explain this a little bit. There's two different ways to live in the tree of life. 
You see, there was, a, there was a tree, the knowledge of good and evil, one tree. The other tree was the tree of life. The tree of life was what you live forever in. And God says, I don't want you eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without the life of God in the middle of it will be poison to you. This is why there's people that have a relationship with God based upon the merits of what they do. And by, you know, the different pillars that you have to do in Islam or, and, and different things you have to do to get rid of bad karma in and, and, and Hinduism and all these different things you're trying to do to try to appease the gods. You've got to do all these lists. And, and, and if we're not careful, Christianity can become nothing more than trying to obey a bunch of rules and regulations. And it's exhausting because it goes on and on and on. I can't do it. It's crazy. But God is not asking us to live just in the knowledge of good and evil. He wants us to choose the tree of life. That's the first tree we're supposed to eat out of, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so what does that mean? What's the two ways to live your life? You can live your life in the knowledge of, of, the, of good and evil. It's all about rules and regulations. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment you do whatever you want to do. But Jesus made it very clear, by the way. What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and your neighbors yourself. If you love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, guess what's going to happen? You're going to automatically begin to obey the rules and the right ways of living because you're going after God. And the natural attributes and the natural things that take place is that. We've had people come to church, gave their lives to Christ. I wasn't even preaching about it. And they make an appointment with me. Pastor, yeah, uh, we, we, I don't know what it is, but I, I feel like I'm, I, I shouldn't be getting drunk anymore. I don't know why. Well, the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Pastor, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I, I should not be living with my girlfriend anymore. I feel like we should get married. I didn't say a thing. Just by following God, they start figuring out what's right and wrong. Not because God wants to take away their fun. God wants to give them a greater life, right? So how, life is how we view God. You, are you going to view God as a great umpire or savior? Jesus did not die on the cross to be an umpire. You're out, right? No. He died to be your savior. One day he will judge, however. But he's come as your savior. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Now, let me show you the difference between living in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and living in the tree of life, okay? Knowledge of good and evil is all about rules and relations, all about rules and regulations. And if you're not careful, church, let me tell you right now, you take Jesus out of church, I hate church without Jesus. I can't stand Christianity without Jesus. It becomes an oppressive, diabolical entity that brings misery to the world. When you take Jesus out of the church and just follow the things of Jesus, but not Jesus himself, look out. We're in a legalistic or a moralist or, an, or, or, or a church that has no morality, and it is the complete disaster, right? If, just what Jesus says, I want to show you two different ways you can read this. If you, if you live your life in Jesus Christ and you view God through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is how you'll read it. You will keep my commandments. Sorry. <laughs> that was just it's an illustration. For those of you walking, watching at home, someone just got up and walked when I said that. Okay. See, if you were here, you wouldn't appreciate that. Okay. Okay, so you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you keep my commandments, you don't love me. Keep my commandments. Or, how's this one? Hey, if you love me, you're going to want to keep my commandments. You know, when I spend time with my wife, Sandra, I want to, I want to forsake all others. I want to spend time with her. I want to love her. Why? Because I love my wife. I want to spend time with her. The natural reaction is to do the right thing. Do I still have to have rules not to do the wrong thing? Yes. But that's not the motivation. The motivation is to love my wife. The outgrowth of loving my wife is doing the right thing. But if all I'm, oh, ball and chain, can't do this, can't do that, ah, she, all she wants is this, all she, it's all about relationship. And by the way, this is a little, little, uh, little word of advice. If you get married and you have kids, don't make, the, don't make your marriage about the kids only, please. You'll destroy your marriage. It's your relationship first. 
But that's beside the point. That is for free, by the way. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So what God would want us how to do instead, he wants us to love him first. When you love God first, you're going to want to keep his commandments because it's natural. It's a natural outgrowth of your relationship with God is obedience to God, not out of duty, but out of delight. Because God knows, I trust God. He knows more than I do. So I'm going to believe his word. Even though everything in my body says no, I'm going to trust God. Because in the long run, it's going to work out. That's, my friends, the difference between living in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Real relationship brings life. So, life, how we view God. How do we view God? It's really important. Another one is life. Second one is our thoughts and our speech, living in life. The first way to live in life the right way is how you view God. I pray that you begin to view God as the lover of your soul. Not the guy that just puts up with you, the guy with the beard, sitting in a chair with a cane, ready to throw an electric bolt at you. No, God's a loving, benevolent father. Do you know the gospel means good news? So life, how we view God. The second way we live in life is our thoughts and our speech. How do we think? I think, therefore I am. As a man thinks of in his heart, he will become. How do we think? Our thoughts and speech is very important. I'm gonna talk about this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. How we speak. We are throwing seeds. Every time you and I speak, we're throwing seeds out. We're either throwing seeds that are like weeds and thistles, or we're throwing out good seed that will grow well. Right now, we're struggling with our lawn. Have you noticed? Don't, please don't look at the lawn. I'm very upset with our lawn right now at the church. So anyhow, we got weeds coming up. And this is it. We're trying. So right now, we, we, we uh, drill seeded. And we're trying to make it better. We're trying to sow the right seeds. You got to sow the right seeds. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. So what are you sowing? You're going to eat what you, what you put out. Whatever you sow, you're going to eat. So what are the words you and I say? It says in the book of James, there, by the way, James doesn't mess up, doesn't mince any words. Jesus' is half-brother says this. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, you think you're a good Christian, and does not bridle his or her tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's relationship or religion is useless. Oh, gosh, that hurts. How many of you maybe are struggle? I struggle with my mouth a little bit. I, I get beyond, I do. I, sometimes I say things I wish I didn't say. Am I the only one here? You see, this is a problem. I grew up, uh, I got two older brothers. David, who's seven years older than I am. Glenn, who's four years older than I am. So I was the little runt. I was the one that was, you know, still a little child. And I, I couldn't compete with them. They're stronger, they're smarter. So the only way I could compete with them was my mouth. I had to learn to use my tongue to cut people up. And I got pretty good at it. I could say things and get them upset and get the two of them arguing and mom and dad would come in. I was terrible. I'd plant little seeds and walk away. In fact, for all of you that have older brothers and sisters, let me tell you a little secret here. Okay, if they touch you, if my brother touched me, I would scream a blood-curdling scream. Ow! Oh, he touched me! I'd start crying, and they'd get in trouble. And I'd go, <laughs> Mom and Dad, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I told you this before, but that's what I used to do. And David and Glenn, sorry. But anyhow, that's what I used to do. What did I used to do? I used my tongue. I was so seized. And so many of us, what do we say in all? Oh, this stinks. This is horrible. <sighs> what kind of fall? Today it's so humid. It's like August. I don't like it. Then the foliage, you know, we had such a drought. This is probably not going to, the leaves are not going to pop this year. Oh, I can't stand the fall because you have to, you have to rake all those leaves and charge. Someone has to come and pay for that. I mean, someone like that. How many people know people this way? That I don't care how good things are going. They come into the room. They suck the life right out of the room. And if you're married to one of them right now, don't you just keep, look, keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> there are people that just suck the life out of a room. Debbie Downers, right? I mean, negative Nellies. And uh, it was all about women here. We probably throw a man's name in there. Um, negative. Ne thank you. Negative Ned. Thank you so much. We're going to be sexist here, Okay. But does not bridle his tongue, deceives his own heart. His religion is useless. And this begins to happen. You see, the tongue is a fire. Have you noticed? A, a word of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among us, our members, 
staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set by the fire of hell. I'm going to just actually show that picture right there. We have a forest fire here, if you can see it. I mean, I mean, all I did was I just said a comment, and she blew up. I just said a comment, and I just got fired. I don't know what happened. I was just telling the truth. I, I speak the truth. So I just, take, I just take it, and here it is in the middle of a drought, and you drop a match in the middle of California. This is what you have going on. And you wonder why. You know, how many remember the, little, the song we used to sing? It only takes a spark. All you guys from the 70s, okay. The tongue is a fire. And so we don't recognize we can say things. Someone can say to you, stupid. You'll never amount to anything. And you say it out of frustration because your son or daughter spilt the milk. You forgot about it. Now they're 45 years old in the pastor's office talking about they can never do anything right. And they remember what their mother or father said to them when they spilt the milk. And the parents didn't mean it. But our words, ow, they hurt. It's like taking a pillow, going on top of a house and throwing out all the feathers and trying to put them back in the pillow. Our words matter. The tongue's a fire. Not only that, you can get rid of that now. Oops. This one I found found kind of funny. I was looking for images. Senior center, wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, stay safe. Come in, join us. (laughs) I just thought it was a little funny. (laughs) All right, I get a sick sense of humor. Pray for me. And the book of James goes on and tells us about our tongue. That's what he says. For we all stumble in many ways, do we not? Absolutely. Check this out. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. This is what the Bible says. If you and I could control our tongue completely, we'd be perfect. Do you know anyone that's perfect? If you think it's yourself, you've got some serious issues. Why? It's very difficult to control the tongue. That's why it's so important that we're going to make sure that our tongue is speaking life, not death. I want to be called a son of encouragement, not a son of something else. Right? I want to be a son of encouragement. And this is what we're, God is calling us to be. Us, uh, encourage people. Speak life. It, everyone has an opportunity for life. You see, gracious words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Rather, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.15, rather, speaking the truth. I just tell the truth. Okay. But why don't you tell the truth in a way that brings life? If you can't say it, if you can't say something to bring light, then why bother? Yeah, but I got to tell them the truth. I understand that. But if you, oh, listen to this. If you enjoy telling someone the truth so they see how wrong they are and it makes you feel good inside, the best thing for you to do is say nothing until your heart is broken enough where you really care about that person not to win an argument. There's one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. Have you noticed that happening right now in our election process? Oh, my goodness, right? But the tongue of the wise promotes health. The truthful lip shall be established forever. So when you speak God's truth, guess what? God's truth is both here and now forevermore. So why not speak the truth about each other? Why not see the best in each other? Why not call and prophesy things about each other and say good things? Why not stir each other up for good works? Do you think we might need that today? Absolutely, right? So how do we live in the tree of life? Living, life. How we view God. Are you going to view God through the knowledge of good and evil? Or out of the tree of life? By the way, we go into a lot more detail in a great course I want you to take. If you haven't taken it, you don't have a small group. It's called, it's called um, Freedom Group. Thank you. I need another cup of coffee with grounds. Okay. Second thing in life. Our thoughts and our speech, what are we thinking about? What are we dwelling upon? Are we dwelling on truth or lies? And finally, life, our actions upon our culture where we live. We should be promoting life. How do we do that? Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, 
Plead the widow's cause. We should be bringing justice to our culture. Remember, we talked about this. Justice without truth is, is dangerous. And true truth is the love of God through Christ Jesus. Speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get their justice. You see, right now, a church should speak about the justice. Speak up for those that are being crushed. Speak for the unborn. The over 50 million babies that have been aborted. If you've been a part of an abortion or you experience that, there's grace and there's forgiveness. But we should speak for those. We should stand up for life. If, if, if the very fundamental life of a culture, if we don't even value the life of a baby in its mother's womb, how are we supposed to have life in our culture? We are, uh, we are burning in a culture of death. Why is it people kill each other now? Because we don't value life. So we should value life from the womb to the tomb. Not just babies as important. By the way, it's not either or. It's everything. So we should pray. We should hold our elected officials accountable. We need to be praying for the Supreme Court nominees that are taking place. Do they believe in the pursuit of truth? These are important. What are our elected officials voting like? What are they like? Find out. Don't listen to the rhetoric. Don't look at how they look or how they talk. Look at what their policies are. Are they promoting life? Right? I'm, I'm going to leave that aside for now. But speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. What about people that are being oppressed? What about whether you, whatever you think? There's a people in our population right now that feel like they're being oppressed. What should you do? Out of love, Listen. See what you can learn. How can you be a blessing to somebody? You're not going to change anyone by arguing, right? Bring life. Find out what's going on. Remember we talked about in the beginning of our time today that the only time people pay attention to you is when you burn something down. The media does not give you any coverage unless you do something that leads, it bleeds, right? Well, there's hurt going on. We should attend to those hurts. You may not agree with it, but at least listen like Christ listens. Be a blessing, help the oppressed. Speak up, what happens if we don't, other people will. And they'll take advantage of the hurt. The enemy sees the hurt, takes advantage of it, and brings in a Trojan horse to destroy our culture. We should be the ones that bring healing. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. In short, justice. Love is justice. If someone is drowning and you're sitting there in a the pool and you're having a drink, oh, the person's drowning, it's not my responsibility. The parents should take care of that child. I'm just gonna sit here and do that. Oh, I love my own kids. Is that love? That's reckless. You hate life if you don't save life. Your kids can't turn a blind eye. So what's going on in our culture right now? We have a culture of death. We have a culture of euthanasia now. Not youth in Asia. There's nothing wrong with euthanasia, but euthanasia. Where you're killing people. They call it mercy killing. So the very people that are bored of their children... Now their kids are going to abort their parents. They're getting too old, taking too much money. Let's have death with dignity. And we can see this happening across our culture. Speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and help us. Finally, as we, he has told you, oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But that you would do justice and to love kindness. Here. And walk What? Ah, what does it mean to be humble? By grace, you have been saved, not by works, lest anyone should boast. When I realize what a screw-up I am without God and what a walking disaster I am without God, then I am a lot more gracious to people who are missing it. We should have great, great grace for folks who don't know. Show them there's a better way. But if they think you're out to show them that they're wrong, they're not going to listen to you. If they see that you're out there to help them, at least you might have an opportunity to make a difference. You see, Jesus is life. At every moment, we choose to live in life or death. What are you living in? What am I living in? Are we living in life or are we living in death? And you have to make that choice all the time. Am I going to think death thoughts? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the Zoe, the life. 
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. My friends, that's the big deal here. That you can connect yourself to heaven. And that the best days are always ahead for you in Christ Jesus. And that my identity is wrapped up in what Christ has done. Although my body be destroyed, with my eyes I shall see God. This is not the end. I'm just a passing through. And one day I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I have his life inside of me. And no matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how much destruction there is, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust but any gate. Christ is a solid rock. Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you used to walk with God. Maybe you used to follow God. But man, you've been following your own way. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've always had a caveat. I'll do that, but I won't give my whole life. Jesus requires something. He requires everything. If you don't give him everything, you've given him nothing. It's all or nothing with God. And the good news is, when you give him all, you get everything. Because he's your creator. He's the lover of your soul. If you'd like to give your life to Christ for the very first time, maybe you've fallen away and you want to get right, I'm going to repeat after me this prayer to help you on a new path. Say, Lord Jesus, go ahead, pray. Lord Jesus, in your own way, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all the things I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown, all my sins, missing the mark. And today, I choose to make you the Lord and the Savior and the owner of my life. I hand my life over to you. Take my life. It is yours. Thank you that I am now your child, according to your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the very first time, there's a card in front of you in the seat, or you can go to the, um, you can go to, uh, to, you can text as well. You can text begin on your phone to 94090, and let us know that you made a decision for Christ today. If you could do that. We want to help you, and we have a front desk as you walk out of here today. If you're here in person, you can get a Bible. If you're here online, Ask, we ask you to click on afterwards. We want to communicate with you. We want to help you. Hey, we're in all this together. You know, it takes us together to get through this. So text begin to 94090. Hey, as we conclude our time here today, I just want to let you know, I want to preach. I appreciate your generosity. Thank you for trusting God. The Bible says, the Bible says, test me and see if not I'll open the windows of heaven. How? Through giving your tithes and offerings. God promises if we'll take care of what he's given us to take care of, he'll give us more to take care of. It's that way. So I encourage you to do a text. If you want to text give, you can say Cornerstone Cheshire, text 77977. You can also use our Push Pay app, which you can get on. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to do that. I should find this out for next week. And, or you can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can snail mail. Or if you're here, which you are, most of you, you can use our boxes in the back as you walk out of here today. Father, let's pray right now for the offering. Father, I just thank you for these tithes and offerings. I just thank you that you promise that you will meet all of our needs in Christ Jesus. As we entrust, as we trust in what you've given us, Father, I speak blessing over people's finances right now, that you make, give them all that they need in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody, I just want to encourage you something. I know that we're going through some difficult times. I encourage you to walk in life. Can you do that? Can you walk in life? Let's believe God for the best. Let's look for the best. Let's walk in life. And you know what? You're going to get through this. You're not called to do this alone. And I encourage you to get connected to a small group. As you walk out of here today, there's going to be a booklet as you walk out and go online. But I want to encourage you to, to get involved with a small group. Begin to forge and make some relationships. You're not called to do this by yourself. All right? Thank you so much. God bless you guys. And if you need prayer or anything, you can come up to the front. We have our prayer team. Otherwise, God bless you. We'll see you soon.